I'd like to welcome you to the 11th Annual Undergraduate Economics Debate presented by the Department of Economics and the Undergraduate Economics Club. I'm Zach Bears. You may have seen my face here before. I'm a senior political science and economics major, and I'm going to be moderating the debate today. Um, I hope you find it engaging and the evidence convincing and informative. Uh, we're debating the motion, high-tech employee antitrust litigation should formal or informal agreements between companies be allowed which prevent the, proaching, the poaching of newly trained employees. In support of the motion over here, we have David Chassire, class of 2017, Tristan Deschler, uh, class of 2018, Ryan Manning, class of 2015, and Brian Wells, also class of 2015. Against the motion, we have Willis Chen, class of 2015, Matthew Harmon, class of 2018, Ryan Salem, class of 2015, and Sonia Shuka, class of 2017. I'd also like to introduce our judges. We have Bill Troy, class of 1976, Paul Lawrence, class of 1978, and Sam Jordan, class of 2014. The rules of the debate are as follows. First, our team in support is gonna have 15 minutes to present their argument, um, followed by the team in opposition. They'll have 15 minutes as well, and the time will be divided equally among three members of the team, so five minutes each. Then we're gonna have a five minute period of deliberation between the teams followed by rebuttals. Um, during the rebuttals, we're gonna switch the order. The team in opposition will have nine minutes um, and then the team in support will have nine minutes. The judges will then be able to ask one question each. Um, for each, each question, the teams are gonna have three minutes to deliberate and then we're gonna have alternating order again. The team in support will have two minutes to speak followed by the team in opposition and then vice versa for each following question. The judges will then have 15 minutes to deliberate, during which time we're going to have our scholarship awards presentations, and then we'll have the announcement of the winner and the closing remarks. So without further ado, we can begin with the team in support. Now, many arguments against anti-poaching are from the assumption that, anti, that it is anti-free market and that in, in a free market economy, markets will always work as they should, where the laws of supply and demand always set the demand for the price of a good. Theoretically, this is sound and definitely true in, in numerous sectors. But it would, however, be dangerous to assume that free market practices are exactly, um, are exactly effective across all markets at all times. The tech industry is an example of an industry that isn't necessarily governed by these conditions. It operates on quite a different economic axis to the rest of the economy because it, because it uses the most advanced technologies available. This has led to, on average, higher investments at higher rates and higher risks with a greater emphasis of capital invested into training and proportionally less into fixed assets. Because the industry operates under these very different conditions, its policies too should be observed through this lens. The agreements between firms in Silicon Valley not to poach each other's employ employ employees should not be viewed as a defiant move against capitalism, but rather a recognition of the limitations of the free market economy. The aim of the agreements was to bring about sustainability in the industry, which is important not only for the firm, but for all stakeholders, employees and shareholders alike. Collusion in this way has proven to be successful in the past. The airline industry is one example of how important it is for firms to understand each other in context to their industry. The, Airli the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978 was a federal law that was aimed at removing regulation in the industry and reducing collusion between firms to not pursue each other's workers and set ticket prices. This increased exposure to market forces and led to upheaval in the labor market as the disruption brought about major losses in the industry. Between 1978 and 2001, nine major carriers and 100 smaller airlines went bankrupt and were liquidated as thousands lost jobs. The technologies industry is in many ways similar, very similar to the airline industry, of the airline industry of the late 70s. They both explore the boundaries of, the, of human innovation, 
They both have seen spectacular growth and investment, and they, and they both have employed uh, self-regulation at some point. It would be therefore irresponsible as economists not to learn from, the, from history, especially now that the tech industry accounts for such a significant proportion of the US economy. It is therefore no longer about the financial gains of a few employees. This is in the interest of the US and global economy. So as mentioned, the technologies industry is very large. It accounts for 6% of, of the US GDP, and in 2013, the average annual wage for high-tech workers in Silicon Valley was $196,000, compared to the average of $54,000 in the US. From this, we can see that the average employee in Silicon Valley is already well compensated for their work uh, in comparison to the rest of the economy. Now, this is mainly a problem when looking at its effect on inequality. Census data on the right shows that wealthy people with incomes of over $100,000 are, uh, are, are twice as common in Silicon Valley than in the rest of the United States and in California. This has caused the cost of living in the area to be virtually unaffordable for most people outside of the industry, and no, com no community is, bu is built in binary. The agreements would result in, lower, in a lower inflation of these wages. This high wage rate would be expected due to the rapid growth of the industry and the growing importance of technology in the long-term long economic growth. Um, economists have even uh, coined this term as the state of the technology. However, the largest contributor to this high wage rate has to be the scarcity of skills following the principle of supply and demand. So in his book, The Wealth of the Nations, Adam Smith describes labor as a commodity and firms have gone, and small firms have invested a lot more in comparison to larger firms given their uh, access to capital. And because of this, I believe that um, greater, that these agreements would go a long way in incentivizing firms to invest more in, in training for their employees in the aim of to further promote innovation due to greater security on their investment. Now, considering that intellectual property is the number one asset in the tech industry, it is reasonable to deduce that firms will look into securing their place in the market by acquiring as much of it as possible. Then we look at blue chip companies of the Silicon Valley and consider that most of them have revenues that dwarf small country economies. Apple, for example, has reserves of over $146 billion, twice that of the federal government and in direct competition with talent um, uh, with a startup just, that just left a dorm room. The, the ability for companies to be able to retain their clients will go a long way in increasing their investment and competition and innovation in the industry. <coughs> First and foremost, I would like to make a clarification about anti-poaching agreements. Anti-poaching agreements do not stop people who want to leave the company willfully from leaving. Actually, on the contrary, they're aiding them. Previous methods of enforcement, such as non-compete agreements, do not allow individuals from leaving and working for other companies. APAs, on the other hand, just state that the company under agreement will not recruit or poach from each other. If an individual is not satisfied in their current job, why force them to work it? People who do not enjoy their job will have a lower productivity, which brings me to my next objective. Without anti-poaching agreements, productivity decreases. Unnecessary movement, which is employees who wouldn't have moved in the first place, will cause said drop in production. In today's world, where this poaching is being done on a daily basis, individuals leave certain high-tech companies. Now, since most high-tech companies have a team-based working environment, a quintessential part of the team is missing. This means that this company will now also need to hire someone new, which is, in most cases will also be poached. This employee needs to be trained in ways of the team, be caught up on the projects at hand, and learn the specific systems necessary to successfully complete this goal. Matthew Bidwell, a professor at University of Pennsylvania Wharton Business School, states in an article pertaining to the issue. In noting that external hires need about two years to get up to speed in their new jobs, Bidwell suggests it is because outsiders need that amount of time to learn how to be effective in their new organization, specifically how to build relationships. 
This all costs money and time that these companies do not have. In some cases, it can, be, it can cause as large of a problem of where a product release date must be delayed or canceled. That is a serious drop in productivity. On the other hand, the receiving company also need, needs to take similar action. While theirs may be willful, they still need to train and educate the, uh, the employee on the new systems and projects. But in this case, it makes it more difficult to train this new employee as they are used to an old system and maybe working in a certain way. This issue can be solved if the company hires new employees and trains those employees from the ground up. A certain pattern of poaching can be seen that seems quite cyclical, almost as if the industry is playing a game of musical chairs. Employees keep moving over, whereas there are less seats and more people being poached. In the end, there's a massive amount of people poached, but the productivity of the entire industry is slim. This is a ma major problem for the economy of the high-tech industry. Bidwell concludes in his research, and I quote, results show that internal mobility allows the firm to staff higher level jobs with workers who have better performance but are paid less. Concluding, poaching is not as effective as hiring new employees and training them from the ground up. Secondly, I would like to talk about product innovation within the high-tech industry and how anti-poaching agreements actually benefit innovation rather than prohibit it. Anti-poaching agreements are a small step in what seems to be a larger issue, the theft of intellectual property, the currency of the high-tech market. Anti-poaching agreements prevent certain companies from recruiting individuals from other companies working on the same project and therefore forces them to find an alternative solution. The technology market in this reference can, can, can be compared to Darwinist evolution. If multiple companies build different products fulfilling the same goal, then it benefits the consumer as they now have a multitude of products to choose from. Following the model of survival of the fittest, the best product will survive, or have the largest market share in this case. Isn't that what the free market is about? Letting the consumer choose what product is best? This is what creates healthy competition among the tech firms to innovate more. The more choice, the better the economy will be in the long run. And that is the ultimate goal, a better, more advanced, and stronger economy. Good afternoon, my name is Brian, and my teammates have already done an excellent job telling you about how anti-poaching agreements will give companies an incentive to invest more money in training their employees, as well as the macroeconomic effects to the entire high-tech market. Now, I'm going to finish by talking about the microeconomic effects, that is, how will individual workers and individual firms behave. Um, if our team loses today and we end up in a world without anti-poaching agreements, what will firms do? Well, they won't do nothing. They're still investing a lot of money in training employees and they'll still want to find a way to protect that investment. And we already have a good idea how they'll do it. Like Tristan mentioned, that's a non-compete agreement. Um, this is the most common thing going on right now in high tech. Recent research from the University of Illinois found that about 30% of employees in uh, high-tech jobs are currently subject to a non-compete agreement. So to clarify, uh, anti-poaching is when two companies agree not to recruit each other's employees, and a non-compete is one company and one employee saying, if you leave, you can't work for our competitors. So both of these accomplish the basic goal of protecting the company's investment and therefore encouraging more training. But that's where the similarities end. And our team has found that anti-poaching agreements are a much better alternative, and therefore they should be allowed. So let's go through some of those reasons. First of all, a worker who wants to leave their job is prohibited from doing so if they've signed a non-compete. But anti-poaching only stops the other company from calling. If the worker wanna leave, <coughs> wants to leave, they can leave. So we think it's more fair to workers uh, next, anti-poaching agreements basically enforce themselves. The companies just don't call each other's employees. Uh, Non-compete agreements, on the other hand, have to be violated first, then the recourse is to go to court, file a lawsuit that costs a lot of time and money. Uh, anyone who's ever paid a lawyer's bill knows my next point. The anti-poaching agreements enforce themselves for free. 
the non-compete agreements cost companies a ton of time and money going to court. Uh, all that time and money would be better spent by the company doing whatever their primary business is, hopefully building cool new smartphones and software for us. Uh, finally, there's a potential for abuse. Uh, a recent investigation by the Huffington Post revealed that Jimmy John's requires every employee to sign a non-compete agreement. And I'm sure you'll agree that a minimum wage sandwich maker doesn't need to be under a non-compete agreement. Uh, why did Jimmy John's do that? Well, non-compete agreements are basically free. Companies don't have to pay much, employees don't argue with them, and so there's a likelihood to use them too much. Uh, that's less likely to happen because an anti-poaching agreement requires a company to give something up. They gain employee retention, but they give up the ability to easily recruit. They have to weigh those two things. And because there's both a cost and a benefit, it's less likely to be overused. Um, Here's an interesting consequence of all of this. Anti-poaching agreements actually benefit startup companies. Why is that? Well, an anti-poaching agreement only involves the companies who are part of the agreement. Usually startups aren't. That means startups are free to poach. That means they have an advantage to recruit employees. Well, why do we want startups to have an advantage? I'll bet you already know the reason. Startup companies are more innovative than larger companies. They're better at making cool new things. And that's not just my opinion. Some research that was funded by the Small Business Administration uh, compared the uh, productivity of dollars spent on research and development and found that dollar for dollar, startup companies are five times more productive in research and development than larger companies. Uh, for all those reasons, we believe the anti-poaching agreement should be allowed. They're better than the alternative that's currently being used in the market. They cost less, they're more fair to employees. Why not allow them? It's just common sense. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the team in opposition. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Salem. As has been mentioned, uh, labor is an asset for companies and individuals in our free market economy, especially in the high tech industries where innovation is crucial. You can see here on this entry level intro to economics graph, which demonstrates supply and demand of labor in our economy. On one side, you have employers who are looking at the cost benefit analysis of hiring an employee and on the other side, you have the employers who are selling their labor on what is supposed to be a free market. Our concern is protecting these employees. These tech giants such as Apple and Google and IBM and Adobe, they have resource and power beyond imagination. As of 2014, this is what their market caps look like. These are huge companies. They control a large portion of the technology market and I assure you they don't need protecting or favorable collusion. Firms can already protect their intellectual property through many different legal frameworks. They have copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, non-disclosure agreements, even garden leave agreements in the UK. There's plenty of ways for firms to protect their intellectual property. With anti-poaching agreements, these companies are effectively creating a monopsony due to their market power and domination. A monopsony exists when a large buyer buyers effectively control the purchasing price, in this case labor. If anti-poaching agreements are allowed, the smaller firms outside the agreements who would be willing to pay more for an individual's labor are cut off. Allowing firms to stop poaching is effectively a violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act, which states the following. Anti-poaching laws suppress competition and drive wages down the same effect the monopsony of tech companies demonstrates. The, individu the individuals are selling their labor to the firms. The employees are already at the mercy of these companies and thus laws and concerns need to be directed toward protecting and aiding employees' rights in the market. With that said, employees also research and understand the field and profession they're getting into. The high-tech high industry, the massive company, the startups, the spin-offs, 
They all survive by finding, hiring, and maintaining the most elite employees. And these employees know this. They know the profession they're getting into, and they know the, possi the possibility of being poached is alluring. Poaching exists because these employees are so sought after and are such talented individuals. That's the only reason firms would go through the effort of poaching and attempting to attract other employees. Poaching, or the movement of employees, increases labor efficiency. Employees find where they belong, where they can be challenged and innovate, and which company and culture they fit in best. It is proven that our generation moves and switches companies more than any previous generation in history. We are a very mobile group of individuals in the workforce. But poaching also serves another important purpose, as an information disseminator. The tech companies are able to learn about opportunities in the open market by receiving poaching offers. Information has always been power, and information asymmetry destroys the free market. In a market that doesn't allow perfect competition, or poaching in this case, the wages of these employees are kept artificially low. Not allowing poaching mainly affects the knowledge of opportunities for the individual. Allowing poaching does not mean that every employee will leave a firm and jump ship. On the contrary, they may decide to stay with a company for a lower salary, or they may bargain for a higher salary they deserve, or they may leave a company in hopes of starting their own. These all frequently happen. The issue here is the knowledge and the freedom within the labor market, the dissemination of information. Preventing cold calling or poaching opportunities is cutting that link between tech employees and the knowledge of opportunities within an open labor market. It's not fair to them, and as you'll hear, it's not efficient for the economy as a whole. It's proven to artificially depress wages. It's proven to prevent mobility, and it clearly hurts the formation of clusters and economic hotspots through these lost mobility opportunities and possibilities. These aspects are paramount to a thriving economy, to innovation, and to a free market economy. Remember that anti-poaching law's biggest effect is destroying this link between an employee and the knowledge of opportunities or bargaining power. The Department of Justice has already agreed with us on many of its recent findings. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will begin my case by saying anti-poaching does not support innovation, change, and expansion in the market. Companies should not hold information that can benefit the employees. Companies, in addition to the non-poaching offer, can improve the offers that can benefit the employee. This drives up the salaries, giving more power to the employees. Non-poaching transfers the balance of powers to the bank companies from the individual workers who want to bring their ideas to the market themselves, but cannot, unfortunately, due to not knowing other opportunities out there. Non -po Although um, employee does gain experience and information that is valuable to the company, the trade-off is much more beneficial to not allow anti-poaching legislation or contracts. This is seen in the Cambridge University Press, as it says, and since some of the benefit from training falls on the poachers, there is no way for the worker demanding the training and the firm supplying it to capture all the rewards from this training. Inevitably, therefore, the free market mechanism provides insufficient incentives to acquiring skills. As Ryan previously said, these companies do not need protecting. Big companies already have enough power and money to produce the innovation they want. If companies should have anti-poaching laws or contracts, their power is increased a lot. And this does not benefit individual intellects that maybe would want to be approached with better opportunities that can lead to big breakthroughs and thus more innovation in the economy. The market would be unfair and biased toward the big companies, giving them more power and generating bigger and more powerful monopolies. In the article, Silicon Valley Non-Poaching Case, The Growing Debate Over Employee Mobility, UPenn management professor Ivan Brinkley says, there have to be two factors in determining 
wages and compensation, employees, productivity, and bargaining power. When employees are pr more productive, they generate more profits, and how much of these rents they can appropriate for themselves depends on their bargaining power. Companies can make attractive offers to employees so that they will not leave or walk away with intellectual capital. They do not need to, as the other team said, force people to sign non-compete agreements. There, if there is bargaining between companies and individuals, there will be better salaries and better conditions giving to the employees. As Ryan said, in a, mar a market that doesn't allow perfect competition or poaching in this case, the wages of these employees are kept artificially low. Ivan Brinkley also said, when companies use methods to retain employees, inc their increased power most likely leads to decreased wages and also a drop in productivity since it is an unpriced externality, which is essential in today's economy. He also says, big companies do not include the benefits of the information sharing across firms that raise overall productivity in the economy. According to Bidwell, a productive economy is one where employees are in the right jobs, the jobs that both fit their interests and make their best use of their abilities. When you restrict that mobility, to some extent, you are restricting the employee's ability to get those matches. In Bloomberg Business, Tesla's co-founder and chief exec executive officer says, Musk says, Apple has been trying to poach Tesla employees too, offering $250,000 signing bonuses and 60% salary increases. <coughs> Apple tries very hard to recruit from Tesla, he said, but so far they've actually recruited very few people. Companies like Apple have the means necessary to replace employees, but not, this was not cause a complete disaster in their finance. Tesla's ability to lure talent from Apple could give it an edge as, it, as cars become more like computers. This is the innovation that we need to have in the market for better and more improved opportunities for the good of employees and the market. In conclusion, information should not be withheld from the employees. But rather, their opinion, their options should be broadened with bargaining from both sides. Companies would rather not do this, however, and thus choosing to restrict mobility between companies with anti-poaching laws or regulations, making it harder for the workers to find better opportunities elsewhere. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I will be talking about spinoffs and clusters and how anti-poaching agreements inhibit the positive benefits that spinoffs and clusters bring to the economy. Before I start, I'd like to give a brief description about spinoffs on clusters. Spinoffs are companies that are started by employees from bigger established firms who develop technological innovations during the research and development phase. They then capitalize on these newly discovered innovations by creating a separate company to focus on developing and market um, the innovation for a particular subject market of a particular industry. Furthermore, clusters are created when many companies within a particular industry are formed and are based within a certain geographic area. In short, employee mobility allows um, employees from different firms to meet and network with each other and share ideas and possible technological innovations with each other. If these employees have like-minded interests, they may be motivated to go out and form their own company specifically for the focus of capitalizing on their ideas and developing specific technological innovations. As David Price from the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, he, um, he argued that research has shown that spin-offs proved to be an important um, factor in the rise of Silicon Valley during the 1960s. Furthermore, research by other academics show that in industries in certain geographic areas that have high mobility, employee mobility ha have seen substantial yet positive economic benefits. For example, research conducted by um, Fallick, Fleischmann, and Reitzer have shown that high mobility in the tech, uh, tech industry cluster in the Silicon Valley have resulted in the rapid reallocation of talented employees, ideas, and knowledge to the firms with the best 
with, uh, with the um, with, um, due to firms with the best innovations and the pattern of hyper employee mobility with um, senior in Silicon Valley has spread to other um, industry clusters within the same geographic, ge other geographical areas when, within the state of California. This shows that uh, the similar be economic benefits that are seen in Silicon Valley due to spin-offs and clusters are, repli are uh, similarly replicating other um, clusters with, throughout in other geographical areas throughout the state of California. Furthermore, they also found that hyper employee <laughs> mobility in California's tech cluster tech industry contributes to modular innovation, thereby having smaller companies focus on specific technological innovations. This simple uh, yet important division of labor arrangement plays an important part towards facilitating increasing innovation within the overall industry. And as for the um, economic benefits and relations to the anti-poaching agreements, one can be seen in the drastic contrast of employment growth between the two tech corridors, Silicon Valley in California and Route 128 within our very own Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In 1965, Route 28 had approximately three times more tech employment compared to Silicon Valley. But within a decade, by 1975, Route 120's employment had um, only tripled, but Silicon Valley's um, employment had quintupled five times, which resulted in a 15% higher uh, total employment in Silicon Valley. From 1975 to 1990, Silicon Valley had tripled 128's route, um, route 120's new job creation. In addition, from 1985 to 1990, the number of fastest growing electronic firms in Silicon Valley increased significantly, while the number of fastest growing electronic firms in the Route 120 tech, tech corridor uh, decreased in general. The reason for this discrepancy in economic uh, employment growth and the number of fastest growing high-tech firms between Silicon Valley and Massachusetts Route 120 tech corridor can be attributed to the difference in industry culture between these two tech corridors. Within Silicon Valley, their industry um, cultures features a regional network-based industrial system that promotes learning and mutual adjustment among specialist producers of complex yet related technologies. Their regional, their, the region's dense social networks and open labor markets encourage encourage entrepreneurship and experimentation, and as a result, boundaries between firms are blurred and opportunities for exchange of ideas and technological innovations are substantially increased. The promotion of employee mobility and collaboration instead of utilization of anti-poaching agreements to achieve similar goals encourages spin-offs to be created, which leads to increased job creation and economic benefits to emerge from these companies that would otherwise stifle this dynamic by being involved in anti-poaching agreements. In comparison, the industry culture in the Route 120 corridor is dominated by self-sufficient corporations who prefer um, to have vertical integration with, um, throughout their entire um, production process. As a result, they are um, self-reliant. High-tech employers, they are frowned on employees, uh, employee mobility and rather prefer um, um, lo loyal employees and prefer um, secrecy and corporate loyalty. And as a, as a result of, of this um, rigid as a result of this closed, um, er, closed um, employee arrangement, social networks are more internalized and boundaries between firms and local institutions are more distinct and thus opportunities between ideas uh, for exchange ideas and technological innovations are suddenly flawed. So in conclusion, technological innovations happen in spinoffs and clusters because of high employee mobility between firms. High employee mobility can facilitate the formation of clusters of companies within the same geographic areas and promote the exchange ideas and, and technological innovations. As a result, this increases job creation, increases economic activity within the industry. When anti-poaching agreements are implemented, it stifles employee mobility between firms, which consequently stifles the exchange of ideas and inhibits technological innovations within companies that are involved in anti-poaching agreements. Thank you. So at this point, uh, both teams are going to have five minutes to deliberate um, and form their rebuttals. So we can have some quiet conversation. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthew Harmon, and I would like to begin by addressing research and development. A firm must invest in its employees, and it must do R&D, independent of the status of uh, anti-poaching in the area. Um, 
According to the American Society for Training and Development, U.S. businesses spent $171.5 billion on learning and development in 2010, the most recent year for which data is available. Firms across the country are increasing employee investment, and California tech companies are leading the way. Google has Google EDU, a focused training program for new employees. Karen May, Google's Vice President of Leadership and Talent, who has led the revamping of Google EDU, notes that it is evident in employee satisfaction scores that it does make a difference when we invest in people. Um, moving on, the sharing of technologies should be seen as a good thing. We have multiple, uh, while having multiple avenues to solve the same problem may sound like good competition, from a macro scale, it is inefficient. Um, say company A solves a problem that company B can't solve. The sooner company B solves that problem, the, so the sooner those two companies are competitive once again. If ideas are shared at a greater rate, companies will have to push each other to innovate faster. This higher level of competition makes the industry as a whole move faster. Um, regarding small firms and startups, uh, small firms and startups are not as vulnerable as they're made out to be. Small firms uh, and startups do have venture capitalists backing them, so their funds aren't significant, and they have some financial freedom when it comes to experimentation and research. Uh, more importantly, the magnitude of these reserves in one company do not determine on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not they will poach a given employee. If a firm has billions of dollars, yes, it allows for flexibility. However, just because they can afford to buy numerous employees doesn't mean that these employees add value to their production. The only thing any poacher has to do, regardless of whether they are big and small, is a cost-benefit analysis as to whether or not poaching given employee is worth it, as Ryan mentioned. Um, as far as intellectual theft goes, uh, firms take into account that people will leave. Uh, for any given technological project, there's a large team composed of numerous people who all have specialized tasks. If intellectual property theft is a concern, then consider that Lisa, the programmer, is a member of a team who likely only knows one piece of a much, much larger puzzle. This programmer doesn't know every facet of the project, nor does she necessarily know all of the other pieces of this, how all the other pieces of this puzzle are put together. So poaching Lisa doesn't mean that you're getting the whole technology. You're just getting a good programmer. Uh, and as Ryan mentioned earlier, there are many, many ways to protect against intellectual property theft. Um, now onto the final idea of excessive mobility. Uh, the opposing, or the affirmative team has suggested that excessive mobility creates great inefficiency in a marketplace. However, I think, pers well, I think this is uh, slightly exaggerated. Uh, if everyone can uh, poach if all companies can poach, uh, other companies will have to guard against poaching by making strong incentives for workers to stay loyal. Again, they won't spend more than employees worth, but if they can keep an employee, that's just competition. Allowing for poaching does not mean that people will leave. People still have free will. As Sonian mentioned with Tesla and Apple, uh, workers just like to work at Tesla. They get bid away from Apple and they just prefer to work at Tesla. Um, so yeah, people will go to the place that's best for them. Workers will go where they are paid the most, where they are most comfortable. Uh, when a worker finds a place, um, they, will either, they will either remain loyal or they will, get, they will get a better offer and they will leave that firm. A person will never be paid more than they're worth, so people will eventually find a resting place where they can't possibly bid, be bid away from that place. A company can't offer them any more uh, and they can't be bid away from it. And even if an offer is made to an employee, there are various social and personal frictions associated with changing one's environment. Perks and benefits also play a strong role. This concern over excessive mobility, or as musical chairs, as they've mentioned, is, uh, is so somewhat inaccurate because someone will eventually find a chair that fits them and they'll stay in it. <laughs> this emphasis on productivity loss assumes that employees are constantly in motion yet uh, this is not feasible. They will likely find a place and settle down. Thank you. Hi. So I'm not sure how this became anti-poaching versus non-compete. Uh, these are very different things. Anti-poaching is company to company, and non-compete agreements are employee to company. The mobility is lost because employees don't know about the opportunities. They are kept in the dark. Yes, it's obvious that non-competes restrict mobility more. That's not the question. The problem here is that mobility is restricted because the opportunity is not known. Firms already use non-competes. That's not going to happen more or less with anti-poaching agreements. And then as far as the airline industry, 
I don't think the tech industry is looking at collapse anytime soon. Um, these employees make so much money because of the knowledge they have in the work they do. Does anyone here not have a smartphone? Okay, exactly. They get these salaries because of this knowledge and this workability. So thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Um, the, my opposing team here would have you believe that companies don't need these anti-poaching agreements because um, employees are selling their labor to the firms, and so they need to be able to do that very freely. Um, and they would also say that these arguments or these agreements keep wages artificially low by restricting the freedom and information uh, about opportunities for employment um, by employees at these firms that employ these uh, agreements. Um, and I would argue that there are still plenty of other companies that are not involved in non-compete agreements that would um, that can seek out and offer employment to these like really high-skilled, coveted employees if they want to. So it is not necessarily restricting the information in its entirety. It's only restricting information from certain companies. And usually the companies that have these agreements are large companies. Um, and most people who work in the high-tech industry um, are going to know that there are job opportunities available at firms like Google, Microsoft, Apple, they're going to take the initiative if they want to leave their company to look for opportunities at these firms. Um, the smaller companies that typically don't have these anti-poaching agreements um, are not as well advertised. Employees might not be able to find these jobs at small firms, but that's okay because the small firms are perfectly capable of poaching these employees. Um, so what this does do is prevent large firms from driving up the cost of high-skilled employees because, as you can imagine, if Google and Apple are competing over an employee, they have trillions or some ridiculous amount of money that they can throw at this person and they can you know, go back and forth increasing the wages um, that they offer him and it creates a leapfrog effect, possibly. Maybe not just two companies, maybe uh, it's one employee, many big firms competing for him, but the point is that these large tech companies can afford to pay them a very high wage, and these smaller companies might not be able to do that. And if you don't allow the small companies to be able to hire the highly skilled workers, you're going to um, decrease the amount of variety uh, in the firms and therefore in the products, which is bad for the economy overall. Thank you. So I want to confront the opposition's view on investment and poaching. Firstly, Ryan, I want to thank you for redefining what the difference between anti-poaching and, and, and non-compete. In your, in your argument, uh, you cited articles that constantly referred to um, non-compete. For example, the Cambridge article does not necessarily argue that uh, anti-poaching discourages investment, but rather non-compete do. In fact, I had the pleasure of reading Bidwell's article as well, and uh, he argues that um, anti that anti poaching re uh, reduces mobility, not pre doesn't it doesn't prevent it, and if any if anything it it uh, discourages hypermobility, and this has huge um, this has huge effect when you look at motivational theories. Now, the basis of the opposition's argument is that money is the largest motivator, whereby you pay somebody. X amount of money and the next person comes ab across and plays them X plus one, they'll be more likely to work more for that, for that extra dollar. But this is not true. If we look at motivational theories, for example, Herzberg's hygiene factors or Maslow's hierarchy of needs, monetary, monetary, fa monetary factors are definitely in there, but they're at the earliest and most preliminary rounds. For workers to really um, start to pay back on their investment, we really have to look at the impact that the company has on their self, on their self uh, actualization and their self, um, their self standing, and th those are the factors that um, anti-poaching would really help uh, a company build within an employee. Hello. 
one of my opponents uh, drew an analogy between California and Massachusetts. And in economics, it's often difficult to do large-scale studies um, because you can't control the behavior of companies and put them in a control group and a test group. So you have to look at the real world and try to find a natural experiment. Uh, unfortunately, we don't think they've done a good job of that. <clears throat> so there are a lot of differences between Massachusetts and California other than anti-poaching agreements, which could account for the difference. Maybe all the programmers like the better weather. Not today. Um, there's lower taxes in California. We all know that Massachusetts is a very high tax state. Maybe that has to do with a difference in business activity. In any case, the analogy just isn't well drawn. Um, next, there's this idea of limited information hurting uh, workers. And anti-poaching agreements usually only involve a small number of firms, big firms. You know them, Google, Microsoft, Apple. And workers who are looking for a new job already know that those firms exist and can easily call up the human resources department or call their friend from college who works there. Um, so we're not convinced that the lack of information is significant or widespread enough um, to have a big impact. Uh, is mobility always a driver of innovation? We're not sure of that. Stealing is certainly not the same thing as innovation. And if the whole argument is just that engineers leaving one place take an idea and take it to the other company, that doesn't drive innovation in the economy. Um, next, I want to respond to this idea of comparing non-compete agreements with anti-poaching agreements. Uh, the reason that comparison was drawn is because a non-compete agreement is a real thing that's happening every day that accomplishes the same goal as an anti-poaching agreement. Uh, let's say you were cooking a batch of chili and you wanted to make it less spicy. And you took out the black pepper, but you left in the cayenne pepper. That wouldn't accomplish your goal. Likewise, a non-compete agreement is something more restrictive. An anti-poaching agreement is less restrictive. So if you're going to allow non-competes, you might as well allow anti-poaching. And if you want to remove restriction, make it more fair to employees, uh, you should remove non-competes first. Um, thank you. Now we're going to have our question and answer period with the judges. Um, the judges who want to ask questions can come up and ask them at the podium. Then both teams will have a minute to deliberate. And then uh, we'll start with the team in opposition uh, in support on the first question. Um, they'll have two minutes to answer, followed by the team in opposition, who will have two minutes. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Jordan, class 2014, uh, former participant in this debate. Um, so my first uh, question will be uh, for the support team. You noted that uh, high wages were a reason to, uh, to utilize anti-poaching and to perhaps to cap those wages. Um, shouldn't those high wages, uh, or I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, the high wages themselves being the incentive for young people to join uh, that industry or career path uh, and then increase the supply of labor there and minimize wages in that stance. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and then for the opposition, um, you provided an analysis of the difference in growth rates between uh, Sil Silicon Valley and the 128 corridor. Um, and you noted that industry culture was a big uh, contributing factor there. I'd like to know the other uh, attributes of that analysis that you took under consideration besides industry culture. Thank you.
Most people aren't as tall as I am. <laughs> so I understand that your question is why these high wages restrict the industry. Am I right? Okay, so without anti-poaching agreements, these large companies such as Apple and Google can compete uh, for certain employees and can poach them, which like both teams stated, these companies have very large uh, budgets. They can kind of throw money at the problem and say like just artifi artificially increase these wages, which restricts the startups or the smaller companies from actually acting upon maybe poaching one of or hiring one of these employees. And we all know that these startups are um, the drivers of innovation. Take, for example, Apple. Apple wasn't always this huge company. Apple started in a garage. And they were competing against IBM, this multinational billion dollar corporation. And look at them now. They're the largest company in the world. So I mean, these high wages are not always an incentive to go somewhere. Maybe it's the innovation also. And if these large companies are always driving it high, that may become an incentive, but that maybe shouldn't be the incentive. Okay, so Samuel, you asked a question about the difference between Silicon Valley and Route 120 and other attributes that can contribute to the difference between those two tech corridors. So, um, so one of the factors is that um, Employees can um, little, uh, leave on their own if, if they choose to um, do so, and it's all bringing back to the fact that um, that about employee mobility and how Silicon Valley was created in the first place. And in fact, um, Silicon Valley was created in the first place because of employee uh, mobility, because um, it, it was resulted from one big company that was established there during the 1950s, and employees thinking that they could do better on their own by because they. Um, they developed technological innovation and thought that, hey, I could have the more freedom, more, um, more room to further develop these technological innovations without, you know, without um, the company um, essentially bothering me. And so this was one of the reasons why the, the famous chip maker Intel was created, just because from the spinoffs and clusters that was created in Silicon Valley during that time. That's a fun fact. <laughs> And also, um, employee, employee mobility has shown, um, ha has allowed um, other employees to meet with each other from even from competing firms um, to, you know, to bounce off ideas of one another. Maybe they might talk about, for example, they might talk about with each other about how, what, they're, what they're working on within their respective companies. And then they realize, hey, our interests, our work are, you know, almost interrelated with each other. Why can't we, you know, just um, leave the companies they're working for, go into the business ourselves and create um, a product based on the idea, based on the the th uh, the things that we're uh, we're working for, and focus focus specifically on that submarket with specific industry, and you know help uh, foster technological innovations uh, through the simple division of um, labor strategy. And we even agree with the um, with the opposition that the with the sorry the affirmative that. Um, Small businesses drive innovation, and in our case, uh, you know, startups formed by um, by spinoffs and and clustering has re resulted in plenty of technological innovation in Silicon Valley that um, that even um, continues today. And also another attribute um, that I would also consider is company culture, benefits, and perks. And while they are um, th they are usually um, not uh, measurable. By, not all measurable by um, by its monetary value. It is clear nowadays that you know employees clearly um, when they think about what uh, which companies they want to join and, and work for, they want to see what kind of culture, environment, um, benefits, and perks they offer because they want to you know you know be happy in the first place and be the most productive ever.
Oh, now I have to adjust this thing. <laughs> uh oh. Oh no. Oh no. He's made an error. Okay. Hi, I'm Bill Troy. I don't usually need a microphone, but I, <laughs> but I need a good stand. Um, so I was a high tech executive for 17 years, so I have more than a little interest in this topic. Um, so for the, pot, for the change team, I, I, I don't know why we would change supply. And the reason for that is if we're seeing above market wage rates, isn't the real problem we're not training enough scientists and engineers to fill those jobs? And isn't that all we really need rather than worrying about suppressing wages? That's for you. For the other team, uh, having been in high tech a long time, I'm troubled by a lack of definition of what high tech means. What industries would you count? For example, the 1960s were a time of defense. In the 1960s, the main issue besides training was security clearances. And that probably takes more time than actually training people um, and getting their software engineering skills up. So I'm asking that team to think about what do we mean by that industry? And don't, don't tech industries change in definition and scope every three to five years? Thank you. Um, so I understand that the question is, um, what are these companies, like these tech companies, and as we are progressing every five, ten years, they, they're always changing. Um, so what makes them tech companies? And um, uh, I'd like to answer that question um, by saying, first of all, that's a tough question, because, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know, we, we didn't know 20 years ago, we would be at this point um, following the progression of everything that has been leading up to this point, like companies like Facebook, for example, which um, just came from a college dorm. Um, and so for my example, where I talked about Tesla, um, they took, um, they poached um, a programmer from the Google company and he, um, in his, this example, he used his uh, knowledge from building computers to advancing, taking that, and uh, working with Tesla with their auto, uh, auto um, company. And now um, they're thinking about um, you know, building better cars, more efficient, and they're becoming more computer-like, and generally um, just more innovative. And we never know where that can go in the future. but. We know that it, it is improving. Everyone is working hard to um, just come up with creative ideas that can reduce global warming, can just um, be more innovative and support um, values that the market should should bring up forth. And um, these these companies like Google and you know Facebook, they have like millions of, of workers and they will not be damaged by just trading off um, a couple of employees who want to, who can be poached by other companies and bring more innovative ideas. And that's why we, um, I think that answers the question. Thank you. Hi, so um, from what I understand, uh, your question was kind of, um, do you think that the real problem is that um, there's not enough supply of engineers, that labor supply um, of these skilled workers? And um, I think that I would agree with that if these firms were poaching people um, that were more run-of-the-mill programmers, so people um, with you know less experience in that world, so coming, maybe coming right out of college, stuff like that. Um, increasing the labor, if they were poaching those kinds of people, then increasing the labor supply would be good. But what happens is that uh, these people are usually, tar or these firms are usually targeting really high skilled workers. Um, so there is a, you know, smaller pool of them increasing, you know, getting more people trained on the basics of it is going to create a lot of low skilled workers. 
And these people poaching employees are really looking for high skilled workers. So I think that um, increasing the supply of engineers in this case would not bring down the wages because they're still going to be poaching the people who are, you know, really skilled at what they do. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Paul Lawrence. I have uh, two questions. One for the support side. Um, could you explain to me the microeconomic incentives for my large firm to join this organization that I cannot identify all the other participants in the agreement? And to the anti-firm, early in the argument, or the, these guys over here, I'm sorry, early in the debate, your opposition pointed, uh, made an argument about the airline industry and deregulation leading to de decrease in wages of the employees. Can you offer an alternative explanation for what happened to the airline industry in the 1970s? No, no, no. I'm asking you to offer an alternative explanation for their argument. Paul, thank you for your question. And um, I have no clue what it'll look like in the future, but in the recent case that was just settled in federal district court, uh, there was transparency. Uh, it was just a network of agreements, but each agreement just had two parties, so the companies knew who they were joining, and Google made a separate agreement with Samsung, a separate agreement with Apple, et cetera. Um, perhaps in the future, a hypothetical network without transparency could form, and I, I hadn't thought through that. Um, but to answer your basic question about microeconomic incentives, uh, the primary incentive for a company to join an anti-poaching agreement is to keep their employees, um, prevent them from leaving because they've been enticed away by uh, a job offer from a competitor. Thank you for the question. Um, if I'm correct, the question is to explain alternatives for what could have taken down the airline industry. Um, so first off, the airline industry is very service-based. Most tech companies are very commodity product-based. So in a service base, you can only put a couple hundred people on an airplane. Um, you can make so many iPhones and sell them out. So that's one big reason. Um, and if we remember Southwest, I believe, has never posted a loss. They've always had profits. They had a very intelligent, um, business plan, so this wasn't the entire airline industry, this was a large portion of them. Um, secondly, they faced a lot of huge costs, the airline industry, that the tech industry doesn't have, like the cost of fuel, uh, the cost of products, a lot of different personnel, different uh, airline control people. So I believe there's a lot more that went into the airline, a lot more expenses than exist in the tech industry. Um, and also, the airline industry is very substitutable. Um, so people could drive a car instead, they could take a bus instead, they could take a train instead. I think the airline industry, especially a while ago, was a very luxury idea versus technology now where everyone's got technology. I think even the lowest end of the spectrum has technology all over the, all over the world. So I think they're very different services and very different commodities. Thank you. So our judges are now going to have 15 minutes to deliberate and choose a winner. And in that time, um, acting chair of the Department of Economics, Professor Jerry Friedman, will present the Department of Economics scholarships and awards. And after the scholarships and awards are presented, the winner will be announced. So uh, the judges were very impressed with the preparation that both teams had done. Um, we all noted the public speaking skills of the teams were very, very good, and where I work, we look at what we call executive presence. Do the people convey an idea in a way that you're confident and it is believable, and that was very high on everybody's side. At the heart of this, what we talked about was this being a discussion of the importance of a competitive market. 
And so we felt that the team actually in favor of competition and keeping the marks probably could have done a better job driving that point home. Okay, so while I think your argument was very, very solid based on sort of all our knowledge, that that was perhaps uh, could have been a little more rigor in explaining why competitive market is so important. Conversely, the team that none of us intuitively believed in did a very good job <laughs> of trying hard to leverage economic arguments, some of which had some holes, but they weren't for lack of trying and you know, understood the kind of arguments. And so therefore, winning is always a tough term, but as we say in the marketplace, that's how it works. We ruled you as the winner, so congratulations. <laughs>